Welcome. My name is Erin McGrath. I am one of the ladies of Kamikaze, and this is the first panel of the 2021 hybrid edition of Ladies Con. Uh, in the past, we have had this live in Somerville. There will be a live component on Saturday, September 11th in Davis Square at the Dilboy BFW and at Kamikaze. You can go to ladies.con.com for information about our guests, vendors, and the locations of those spots. But now I am excited to turn this over to Kagan Luce of Comics in Color, who is our moderator for this excellent panel on comic strips. Awesome. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, um, I'm very excited to be here. Again, my name is Kagan Luce. I am a visual artist and a comic author. I am a co-founder of Comics and Color and the Boston Comics and Color Festival um, right here in Boston. And um, I'm also the author of Lunchtime Comics and The Market, which appear in um, Big Boston and the Boston Compass. And I'm uh, super excited to be here uh, to present this panel, uh, Life on the Strip, Creating Short Form Comic Strips. Uh, for Ladies Con 2021, and very honored to be the first panel to kick off this con. So this is really, really exciting. Um, I'm really excited to present this panel. When the ladies came to me uh, asking if I wanted to do a panel for this year, I quickly figured out exactly what I wanted to do. I, I really wanted to talk about strip comic forms. I feel like... Um, in the conversation about comics and at cons and festivals and stuff, it kind of gets lost, uh, the strip format. A lot of times when people are talking about comics, they're talking about comic books or superhero comics, but there is so much more. Um, and I think that, you know, it's important to remember uh, about comic strips. Um, I, I talked to a lot of people about how they got into comics in my uh, work with comics and color. And, you know, oftentimes they talk about how they grew up reading strips in newspapers, uh, you know, Garfield, uh, uh, you know, a Foxtrot and all those kind of comics. And that was kind of a gateway into reading more comics. You know, they never missed a Sunday, uh, you know, Sunday funnies, uh, you know, the color and the bigger strips. So, and, and you know, comic strips have been around forever. And I think they're a very important part of the comics culture and a part of American culture as a whole. So this evening, we're, I'm excited to talk to these three amazing artists who have worked in this format and talk about some of the challenges and some of the successes that they've had um, dealing with this format. Um, first, let me introduce Dion Super D Parsons. He is an award-winning award-nominated cartoonist and animator based in Indiana. His resume includes syndicated comic strip titles, Life with Kirami, uh, published and Glyph-nominated anime book series, Pen and Ink, and published comic strip series, Rosebuds. All his work follows the theme of love in their own ways. He tries to bring love to, the other, to others with his characters. When he's not creating, he's teaching comic book workshops to children, teens, and adults at various schools, libraries, and art museums. And he also collects too many Garfield books, which we have in common. I collected, I must have had 30 comic, you know, Garfield books when I was a kid, because I absolutely loved uh, Garfield. Um, second, let me introduce Christina Steen Stewart. Um, she is a St. Louis based car cartoonist, editor, and professor. She's the co creator of the Dwayne McDuffie award winning graphic novel Archival Quality and is featured in several short story anthologies such as. Eisner and Ignatz winning Elements of Fire and the upcoming horror, well, it's not upcoming anymore, Dead Beats. I think this is maybe a little bit old. <laughs> I apologize. Um, who's launched and edited the popular RPG period rolled in, uh, periodical Rolled and Told and creates community building comics related programming and is frequent convention panelist. Steen currently teaches cartooning and she also is now cre the creator or I don't know if creator is the right word, but she is doing life. Uh, part tell of the me city. the name of <laughs> part of the city. I'm sorry, I don't know why I blanked on that. Part of the city, a nationally syndicated comic strip. So I'm really excited to talk to her. 
Um, also, LJ, our legend Jean LJ Baptiste is a cartoonist from Boston that works in the art of storytelling via comics and animation and arts education. He is currently available for commissions, lectures, workshops, and more. He can be contacted via email at comicscapelj at gmail, as well as on his Instagram and Twitter. So definitely check that out. But welcome to all my panelists and thank you so much for uh, joining us here for uh, the inaugural panel for Ladies Con 2021. Um, so I just wanna hop right into it and ask each one of you to answer this question. Um, what made you decide to use the comic strip format um, in your storytelling? So you just jump in. Sure, mm -hmm. I'll jump in. Um, so uh, my editor told me to, <laughs> is the reason <laughs> for that. <laughs> Cause uh, Heart of the City was actually a comic series that had been going on for the past 20 years. and the original creator decided to step down because doing a daily comic for 20 years is a lot <laughs> and it's about time. So when he stepped down, uh, Andrews McNeil, the syndication that part of the city is with, uh, they still have the rights to the series and they didn't want to like completely get rid of it. So they wanted to do for part of the city what uh, Olivia James did for Nan and uh, wanted to make it for a newer audience. And so um, the editor, Sheena, reached out to me to see if I'd be interested in doing that project, and I was. And so that's how I got into strip comics. Um, originally, I've been doing mini comics and you know graphic novels and, and stuff like that. So this was my first professional for what for a into uh, strip comics, but I've always kind of lean towards those shorter format comics anyway, um, whether they're for myself or I was putting them out as journal comics. You know, there's a reason why I love the hourly comics is because it gives you a finite space. And with that finite space, it challenges you to teach or not to teach, to, uh, to get your message across in a limited space. And so um, it also, you don't have to think about like, super long ongoing stories if you're working in a, a strip format you know you can have an overarching um you know an arc but um it's it's nicer to be able to work with these short one and dones even though it is a, a bit more challenging to do so awesome how about you d uh well, as you guys know, I'm, I'm pretty obsessed with Garfield. So Garfield was kind of my introduction to the comic strip format. And so I would, growing up, I would mimic, you know, how to make comics in those short formats. And then once I started figuring out there, there are other newspaper comics like uh, Peanuts, Calvin Hobbes, uh, Rose's Rose, things like that. I started figuring out how to, you know, write within the limited time, the limited frames of three to four panels and the occasional Sunday comic because they do like double sizes in, uh, in on Sundays. And so that was kind of really my, my introduction and how I got into it. Uh, I, I ended up continuing with it because it was, for lack of better terms, there was a quick way to create something on a consistent basis without having to do something long and overarching like Stin said. Like it's like it is a is both a a nice short but also really complex to do it in in, in just that small in that small frame. But like it's rewarding when uh, you figure out how to really get into it within uh three or four panels or so uh so for me i can i can definitely relate to to both uh what uh steens and d uh, were talking about too um uh i i always was into comics and uh cartoons and stuff like that and i i always loved uh getting to uh, grab the Sunday comics that would be uh, sent to the house every week and just pour over them and 
uh, keep and build up my own collections of them and stuff like that. Look at the differences in art styles from all these different um, artists and um, even just consider the way all these different comics are arranged and uh, everything. Um, so yeah, from the beginning, it's, it's always been something that I uh, gravitated towards and I would do comic strips and uh, like little like four or five page comic books and stuff too. And I think um, when I was around seven in like second grade, one of my classmates giving me a, a Calvin Hobbes book um, that she had because uh, she knew that I liked to draw was like a really huge thing for me because that comic was already over like for it had been like over for years at that point so that got to be my exposure to that series and along with that I got to start to see the stuff that Watterson would talk about with syndicates and the comic strip industry and stuff like that and starting to read about that at a young age gave me an impression as far as just how this stuff works so it it stuck with me a lot uh from then on awesome so this is also a question for all of you uh, what do you find to be the most challenging part of writing in a short form, uh, uh, you know, I, it's not always four panels, but sometimes it's four panels or three panels, and it, you know, it's it's very restrictive. It's a, it's boxes that you've got to fit in, and oftentimes when you're being published in a in a publication, you know, it can only be what they can fit in the publication. Right. So, and as you know, you, you all mentioned that, but what do you find to be the most challenging part about writing a story in that parameter? The writing part. <laughs> 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 like, because to be real, um, the most difficult thing is getting whatever message you're trying to get in 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 as as few as few words as possible. Because when you when you make newspaper comics like I do and Stin does, uh, your comic shrinks like really small and the top, the text, the font, or the lettering gets really small too. So you have to be able to um, say just enough that readers can get an idea of what the story is about without it overwhelming the art and vice versa. And it's it's a really hard balance to do that. Like there there's a lot there's some comics that are really wordy but have less art to it but some have more art but less words to it and so like it works for some not for others and it's just trying to figure out what your groove is and what your what that balance is for how you want to handle your comic and it's as i said it's different for everyone and that's just like the most difficult part is because uh the formats of comics are constantly changing and we're also trying to figure out how to make things work. Like, uh, cause when you also put in like uh, webtoons, for example, like if you have a web comic and you put on webtoons or Instagram or whatever, uh, how those comics work differ from how you have to handle it through print or publication. So it's like, it, it's a really, it's a really like tight rope of, how, how to balance it all. Yeah, and if you're like going back and forth between styles, it, it can get kind of confusing sometimes. I know like at the moment I'm doing a, a graphic novel and so I have to have a completely different template than what I use for Heart of the City. And then for Heart of the City, I do all the pencils, all the inks, all, like everything besides the coloring. But for the graphic novel, I'm going to be doing everything besides the lettering. So it's like you have to really push back the way that you were used to working in order to work on a new style. Um, so, yeah, you're definitely right about that is the writing is is hard for me. It's, it's less so thinking of the ideas because I am the kind of person to like if I get an idea for a storyline in heart, I just 
write it down in my notes immediately. And then when I come back to it, I'm like, okay, let's expand on this. And that part is not as difficult as the, the part of putting it into four panels. Because the way that I do it is I write an entire storyline. It doesn't have to be well written. <laughs> it just needs to be there. So I need to write out exactly everything that happens in this, this short arc, whether it's, you know, cat needs to get glasses for, for example. So then I have to figure out, okay, well, which part is going to start off my Monday, you know? So I have to kind of section off the story into days. And then once I section it into days, then I need to section it into panels as well. And then once you've done all that sectioning, you still have to think about um, making sure that there's a punchline. Like it doesn't even have to be funny, you know, it just needs to end like succinctly or like crisp, you know, it has to have a kind of an ending that sticks. So uh, it, it can be easy to, to separate them, but when it actually comes to make this strip stand alone, then that's the part that gets hard. Cause you never know when someone's going to come in and start to read your comic, you know, they're not gonna go, People just don't go through the archive, <laughs> you know? Sometimes they just pick up on today. And if that's the case, you want them to be able to see it, especially if you're not looking online. Like if you're only reading the comic from the newspaper, you can't go back in the archive. So every comic has to be your kind of first impression with new readers, you know? Mm. Well, that's really interesting. So you, you plan out a week in advance, or at least you plan an arc. That was for the example. I plan out months in advance. Uh, wow. Currently, I've got up to uh, April of 2023. So yeah, I plan way, way, way in advance because I am not the kind of person that likes to wake up and think. <laughs> You know, when it comes to, to these comics, it's like, I want that stuff to be done already, you know? So when I get to my, my work table, um, I've either already thumbnailed something, I've already written it, you know, I've, I don't want to have to worry about not having a story. <laughs> right, gotcha. Don't want to be caught out there. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it works for some people. I mean, I was on another panel and most cartoonists are not as far ahead as I am, but I just am juggling a lot of different jobs. So I don't want to get caught unawares, you know? Yeah, so you're, you're a year and a half ahead. That's, that's impressive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about you, well, LJ? What's, uh, uh, what do you find challenging about writing a comic strip format? Yeah, it's, it's both uh, the, the art and the writing. Um, at times. Um, so one thing that, well, one of the things I really respect about uh, both uh, D and Steens is they're uh, these cartoonists that are working with these syndicates for their comic strips. And I, I do uh, my comic book series, uh, Comicscape, and I'll do comic strip versions of that and some other things here and there as well but I, I haven't worked with a, a syndicate. So the comic strips that I make are uh, just, it's just uh, the process of me figuring out how I want to uh, put that together and uh, what can work the best way for uh, how I want to share it. But even with that, like I've had times where I have to go back and forth with uh, just what the format is or how many panels there are because you don't want uh, the work that you have um, in a comic strip format to be too overwhelming or confusing or to uh, not be not be uh, in a good size to share for whatever platform you're going to put it out for. So even doing it without having the added layer of working uh, with the syndicate can uh, make things uh, more complicated um, as well, which was uh, interesting for me to just discover. So uh, like I did, I did a comic strip that I forget exactly how many panels it was. It, it was slightly more than four, um, but there was just this one panel in it that had 
um, a beat to it. So it had um, a, a character just looking at another character and there were no words. And it was just this silent moment, just letting everything sink in before the final panel. And that that panel was such an important uh, part of the, the comic to me. But I remember when I initially posted it, I just cut that panel out because I needed to have just a certain number so that everything can be visible uh, clearly to anyone that is just scrolling through. So little things like that can be a lot to just go back and forth on. I found um, just figuring out which thing you have to cut out for pacing purposes and which things you can leave in and where the negotiables are and where the non-negotiables are. So yeah, that's that's been the, the battle with uh, comic strip formats at times for me. That's a really good point about the uh, about going and, and, and like figuring out the pacing and figuring out what needs to be cut and what doesn't need to be cut because, you know, not everyone is going to have an editor to like ask those questions to. So oftentimes yeah. you have to make those decisions, you know, and mm -hmm. even if you're working on a graphic novel, like you can't email your editor like ev for every single question, you know, so a lot of times you just kind of have to like stick to it and just be like okay I need to make this decision right here and those decisions take up brain power which is exhausting <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> yeah don't get me started for sure <laughs> yeah so LJ you now you uh in your comic escape series you re initially released those as strips right and then it you put it into a book which was, but you had, but it was a continuous story. So did you, mm -hmm. do you, you planned out the entire story beforehand and then broke it down into strips and then put it back together? Or was it, you know, you kind of did it as you went along and then put it into a book or how did that work? Oh, all of the above. <laughs> In different ways, all of the above. Uh, so yeah, it was um, just, initially it was uh each page but it was like a full page not like a uh not a four panel um comic strip format per se but yeah it would it would just be those full pages being posted one at a time and initially it was like one page a week and then i moved it up to two a week and then um eventually put the books together and, and structured it into chapters and stuff but yeah, when I started, I, I just wanted to see if I could do it. So I just did the first 10 as like one piece in a, in a week and then those released weekly. And then over time, I started to just build on top of it and then figure out what the whole story is and then go from there. And now for the, the newest one, volume four, I'm working on it as if it's just a full graphic novel and then uh, but I'll still release the pages on their own as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. <laughs> hey, <laughs> however you want to do it, bro. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's great. Well, so do you all have like a favorite? So, okay, so I, I work in the comic strip format, as you may or may not know. And, um, you know, I've done a couple of hundred strips um, on my uh, series. And, you know, some of them, um, like, I really got it this time. Like, this is dope. I really, I really, everything came together. The artwork and the, the words all came together to work. And some of them are like, yeah, they're okay. So I wonder, I'm asking now to you, like, do you have particular strips or episodes of your story that you're particularly proud of and that you feel, feel like worked really, really, really well and you're proud of it? And uh, why don't you start, D, and tell us about that? Oh man, on the spot. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a hard question. Uh, I was like asking, "What's your favorite kid?" Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just I have like like multiple comic series. I have to like cycle through so many different comics from all three different of them. I'm like, oh man. Um. Oh. Uh, Okay, uh, so I guess I'll do uh, Life with Crowley because it was my first comic I did. Uh, my first comics, my first published comic series. Um, 
so this like the comic strip is about a single mother named Anna who's trying to raise her infant daughter Karami and trying to overcome her self doubts and anxieties and you know trying to prove to herself that she's a good mother and a good person. And so there was a story arc I did that kind of was like uh, like the idea of what the series is about. Um, the story arc was like Anna was trying to go to the grocery store and Krami was being uncooperative, you know, as babies sometimes are. And so one moment, uh, Krami's just crying wildly in the grocery store and Anna's incredibly embarrassed about it. And she's thinking, oh no, people are like thinking I'm, you know, such a bad person or a bad mother. And she's just walking through the aisles just while everyone's staring at her. And she's thinking so low of herself. And then the final, like one of the final panels is that everyone was just thinking, encouraging thoughts sort of like, I understand your pain, keep going. You're doing great, girl, you know, things like that. Um, that was one I actually showed to Jim Davis, creative Garfield, because he's actually been a mentor of mine and was the one that actually helped get Life with Karami syndicated. And he kind of told me, like, this was, like, this is the pinnacle of what the idea of what your comic is. It's about trying to overcome your self-doubts, overcome, you know, be perseverant and trying to allow yourself to continue uh you know, continue on even when you think you're at your lowest, you know. And so I feel like that comic, uh, you know, sits with me a lot and is kind of a reminder of what I try to do, you know, with the main message of the comics and things like that. Well, I can tell you that that is super relatable. <laughs> As a parent, I have been in that situation multiple times with a kid just falling out in the grocery store <laughs> and feeling very embarrassed. So I appreciate that very much. And uh, shout outs to Jim Davis, dude. That's super cool that you uh, have a relationship with an yeah. idol. Like, so that is super cool. <laughs> is he from Indiana as well? Yeah. That's awesome. That is super awesome. What about you, Steen? It's hard to pick. I mean, it's it doesn't hard. have to be a strip. It could be one of your graphic novels as well. I'm, those are fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like a lot of the things that I do. Um, what's interesting about like picking a favorite strip though is that like so often I have to just move on if I don't like the strip. You know, mm -hmm. like because there's no end in sight for a syndicated comic strip so I can't really be like I'll come back to it later and I'll futz around with it again it's like mm, no you need to turn it in today so if it's not up to your standards too bad <laughs> so oftentimes uh I I because I am the creator I can't stop thinking about the ones that I wish I could go back to and be like I can make this better though <laughs> but I don't know. I like this, the strips that kind of were, A, people understand my like weird sense of humor. Um, those ones, like, I really, really love it when people get the joke and they just like have fun with it. Like there's um, one series where Hart and uh, a cat and Dean are, they see this lump of snow on top of their, the apartment building. And they're like, it looks like a deflated basketball covered in snow and so like Dean was like you should like poke it with a stick and have it come down and then they poke it with a stick and it's wasps <laughs> and so <laughs> Dean is like yelling to Hart's mom you know Miss Lamar we found wasps and like that's where it ends and it's just like I really like those kinds of strips where just absolute like that shit stuff happens <laughs> that you don't anticipate but I also really like the ones where you can kind of slow down and appreciate uh your friends for the kinds of relationships you have with them because I feel like friendships are sometimes the stronger relationships than family because they're ones that you have chosen and you've cultivated and so you have like a stronger connection to those kinds of relationships you have more autonomy in those relationships you know and so anytime I do a comic where 
um, the kids are really appreciative to each other and you know thank each other and encourage each other those are the ones that i really really like um today's strip actually I, i'm pretty sure it's my 500th strip uh-huh wow. and i know wow. it's a lot <laughs> but um Hart asked, you know, Hart and Charlotte were talking about, you know, being at theater camp and Charlotte was saying that she just wasn't getting into the, uh, the lighting class because she kind of already knew everything. And so she felt weird about it. And Hart was like, why don't you just take a new class? Just like take painting. And Charlotte's like, I don't, I'm not good at painting. And Hart's like, that's why you take a class. And so by the end of their summer camp, you know, Charlotte is not a great artist and she doesn't think that her work is any good, but she loves doing it. And so Hart feels like, you know, that's really great that you're doing something that you're not good at because you actually enjoy it. And so the strip ends with, you know, like, wow, Charlotte, these are amazing paintings and Charlotte's like oh my gosh thank you I did, do you really think so and Hart's like I don't know anything about art <laughs> but I do know that these make me feel really really happy and so Charlotte's like thank you for you know suggesting to me to try something new and they're like what are friends for and so it's just like those kinds of strips really make an impact on me when I was younger because I was just I, I'm, I'm an Aquarius moon so I really like things that um, are very emotional like that. So um, I hope that when other people read those trips, they, they get those same warm feelings as I do about friendships. That's a, an amazing message. I really, I like that. That's super cool. And what about you, LJ? Gosh, um, so I'd say one, one thing that comes to mind uh, would be from the the first uh, volume of of Comicscape, like around the uh, end of that volume, because like the second half of the book is taken up with this story. Well, it's it's taken up with this story arc called the uh, Great Raccoon Hunt, and um, it it features the the main characters um, going into the woods to uh, rescue this raccoon character that the main character Tyler befriends at the beginning of the the series before he uh runs off and it's kind of like a weird like Looney Tunes-esque situation with uh some of the uh the hunter characters that are around trying to uh get rid of these raccoons that are uh in the forest and uh, at the same time I I introduced this character that is the son of the uh the hunter that's that's out there and then he ends up uh running off from his from his dad and the uh the guy that's hunting with them because he doesn't want any parts in the the hunting that's going on and he never wanted to be out there doing this and he ends up meeting up with one of uh my other main characters and uh, I kind of, I kind of uh, just use the uh, relationships that I build up with uh, the the characters uh, from that to bring it to a point to where this this character, this character that's the the son of the hunter that was feeling like really scared and cowardly, has to decide for himself to um, protect this this uh raccoon character and the other animals and um also the the new friends that he's made and stand up to his dad and um just basically make him uh leave so that everything can at least uh be safe and it, when i was starting to write that arc i didn't know exactly how it was gonna end at the time but it was something that I enjoyed getting to write because it it kind of left the first volume on a bit of a downer note because of uh, how his his uh, his parent responds to uh, what he's saying. But I I liked getting to uh, do that moment because one thing for me as far as the series itself that it got to help establish, um, even just in my own mind, is the 
the important central uh, motif or theme of uh, the, the generation gap or uh, just the relationships that these kid characters have with their uh, parents and how that affects them. So that's that's been something that I've kept prevalent in all of the books. Um, and it's something that I like to explore because um, that's, yeah, like that, that's something that I think a lot of people, like whether they're younger, um, like the main characters themselves, or if they're uh, an adult themselves, it's, it's something that uh, we're considering, like the, the ways that we've been impacted by the people around us that have raised us. So yeah, like for, for me, that first big instance of working with that dynamic was uh, something that um, stuck with me. Very cool, thank you, LJ. Um, D, question for you. So you've got multiple strips you know that you've done throughout your career how do you create your characters like do you base your characters on people you know or do you just like write out a, the story behind them or how do you how do you create those characters so each so i have three uh wife of crummy pen and ink and rosebud um each of them actually follow <clears throat> a specific theme uh based around love uh and each part of that love is also kind of taken from something a part of from my life like for example life with crummy as i said was about a single mother raising her infant daughter um my mother is a single mother and so i kind of you know took that inspiration into life with crummy and the the theme of love in that comic is you know love yourself and that's something that Anna is trying to do, uh, overcome her, you know, overcome her anxieties and things and trying to prove to herself that she is a good mother. Um, Pen and Ink, which is about two sisters that love to create art together. Uh, Pen is the oldest and is kind of the main artist of the two. And her little three-year-old sister, Ink, is the one that looks up to her big sister and, you know, wants to be a super amazing artist just like her and she has the outfit to prove it because she is covered in paint she uses her ponytail as her paintbrush and she's just like the embodiment of messy like even like how she speaks is just like so disorganized but the theme around pen and ink is um love what you do uh i'm an artist myself and i love to create and so pen and ink you know use their love for art to try to inspire others to enjoy the journey and you know the passion of creating and uh my most recent comic rosebuds uh which is through andrews mcneil go comics and also published in newspapers um it's about three sisters uh rosa maria and marcella and you know their bonds and rivalries together as sisters and siblings you know it's like sibling rivalry and just you know trying to get along with one another and the main theme of that is love those around you um the sisters love each other to death but as we all know you know we have siblings or whatnot we would sometimes want to sell them on the black market that's kind of you know what their relationship is like they they love each other they'll sometimes Sometimes butt heads, but they'll always be there together. And so that's kind of like the general concept is that everything is based around like the relationship of characters, based around, you know, the internal, the internal feelings and the relationships that they, that they have with each other. And so by focusing on love, it allows me to really focus on like the sentimental side of you know, appreciating the little things in life, the people that you care about, the people that, you know, you, you want to have those close, you know, relationships with. And so that's, that's kind of how I've handled, uh, how I've handled creating personally and how that kind of reflects, you know, taking from my life. Cause like, 
with rosebuds I didn't get to say, but I also have, you know, two sisters. One one's older than me and one's younger than me. So I'm, you know, the unfortunate middle child of the group. And so, you know, like I take little aspects, you know, from my life and kind of just let it just let it do its own thing. That's a very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Um, LJ, how about you? How do you uh how did you create your characters? Gosh, so for me, a lot of it had to do with, it had to do with uh, considering um, how I wanted to uh, express myself um, through through these uh, different characters. So the, the, the cast of characters that I have in, in Comicscape, for instance, a lot of them are characters that I've had since I was, a, a little kid like around seven eight or so in like different incarnations and stuff like that and so you kind of grew up with them yeah yeah I kind of grew up with them um in a way and over time I got to like see some of these characters uh change I remember there was a time where uh I had the characters just be the same age as me and then each year when I got a little bit older, I would just age them up one year or two to keep them the same age that I was. And then eventually I had to just stop uh, doing that. <laughs> but, <laughs> then, yeah, eventually I had to stop. But um, even, even, even when I stopped uh, doing that for the, the main characters for their, their main designs and stuff, I, I always was interested in just looking at my characters uh, as people. So I, I would, and I, I still do this, I, I would uh, draw up these characters at different ages, different stages of their life. Like, um, um, and I, I'd use it as like an exercise um, to just explore uh, who they are and like what they become and uh, where I imagined they would be. Um, but yeah, as far as their, their personalities too, um, I developed that through doing stuff like that. And also through thinking about myself as a person and the, the different parts of me and, um, how I can, flesh those out and explore them. Sometimes I, I like to get to experiment with uh, writing characters that do and say things that I don't personally agree with or see to eye to eye with because it can also serve as a way to force me to uh, understand my own perspective more um, or, or just develop it more. Um, so yeah like that's that's mainly how i like to approach uh creating different characters that i focus on keeping as distinct from each other as i can and also um there are times where i i can look at other people um around me or close to me and uh consider how i could work with uh who they are or at least my idea of who they are and just flip that in some way for a character. Very cool. Okay, Steens, similar question, but a little bit different since you're working on Heart of the City, which is not your original creation, mm -hmm. but you clearly had to make these characters your own. So how did you, you know, when you started doing, took over Heart of the City, how did you make the characters your own? It's a very good question because, you know, the it's it's intimidating <laughs> at first because you know they they've been around for 20 years <laughs> right. so there's definitely going to be readers who are like that's not what heart would do you know uh, so i think the first thing that i did was i well obviously i read through as much of part of the city that was feasible uh, or common sense <laughs> i didn't read 20 full years, but I read like a couple of months for every year, you know, to get an idea of who these characters were at their core. And so I wanted to make sure that no matter how I changed the way they looked, 
they still felt the same, you know? Um, they still felt like the same character. So with Hart in particular, um, you know, she was precocious and always wants the attention on her. And, you know, she's very dramatic and she loves theater. So it's like, I can use that, you know, I don't have to constantly have her do things that are very specific for a seven-year-old because that was one of the biggest differences between my run and Mark Tatuli's run, which is he took her from, you know, seven to like 11 years old or maybe even earlier. And who you are at those ages are not the same as you are when you're 12 through whoever or whatever, you know? So I, what I did is I, I tried to figure out what, who they were at the core and then found a way to mature that, you know? So if she starts off being, you know, dramatic and loud and, you know, not cleaning things up or whatever, what's the mature version of that? Um, well, she doesn't do her homework because ah, she doesn't feel like it. <laughs> she knows she didn't do it. You know, she's not trying to lie about it. Um, that sort of thing is more like her. Meanwhile, if a different character didn't do their homework, they would stress or they would be like, how am I going to lie to my parents about this? Heart, no, mother, I didn't do the work. I was watching TV. You saw me do it, you know? So I have to really just think about taking what was already there and then just maturing it into a new version for these new readers. Very cool. And I mean, I guess it's lucky that it was a child character because children do change so drastically, you know, they who, do. Yeah, in a year or six months. They could be a com almost a completely different person. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's definitely something that um, is harder to tackle with syndicated comics because I find that fans of syndicated comics like things to be the same, you know? Mm -hmm. So the fact that she's growing up at all is more inclined to like, you know, for better or for worse, rather than, you know, family circle, family circus. I don't know which one it is. I don't know which Mandela <laughs> effect I'm in, but um, but that one, they stay the same age, you know? So it's right. like already I'm doing things that are not typical of common syndicated comic strips. So the closest thing I can get them is making sure that the characters all feel the same. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Well, we are uh, running out of time here. I think we might even be a little bit over time, but I, I wanted you all to uh, just, you know, go around and maybe just tell us who are a few of your favorite comic strips who influenced you and, in, you know, how you create comic strips um, and then tell the folks where they can find your work. So why don't you start, Steens? Uh, okay, so you can find my work at gocomics.com. It's Heart of the City. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's on the main page, so you can find it there. Um, or you can find my books at your local bookstore, Archival Quality, as well as my other anthologies are all available for purchase. Um, you can also follow me online. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Those are where I'm most, uh, where I am most of the time. And if I do any comics, like short comics that I did, you know, whipped out over the weekend, that's usually where I'm going to post it. Is is on my Twitter, my Instagram. Um, as for uh, my inspiration, it's like really cheesy to say, but I'm gonna say it because it's true, um, is my peers. Like honestly, like the reason I do these kinds of panels is to meet other people who are doing the same things I'm doing is to make sure that I'm staying connected to the community of comics, you know? So I would say my fellow panelists would be a few, but um, I'd also say uh, Tahit Bandi, who is doing Crabgrass, very great work. Oh, his, uh, yeah. Wendy Shu, who does the graphic novel Mooncakes and the upcoming Tide song. Um, and Gozi Ukazu, who does Check Please. So these are all three completely <laughs> different parts of the comics world, but it's all comics to me on the inside. So all of it inspires me, you know? I love it. And if you don't mind, can you just like maybe put your, a Twitter info or oh, a website in the chat so yes. people can look you up. I would do that now. <laughs> Great. And uh, why don't you go next, LJ? Yeah, sure. So um, as far as as far as far uh, where to uh, find me, um, that can be done on my Instagram or Twitter. It's just at escapist LJ. And 
Um, yeah, my, my comics can be read on comicscape.net, which comicscape is not a real word, but if you want to see <laughs> how that's spelled, I have the word on the screen right now. So yeah, you should throw it, throw it in the chat for me too, would you? Yeah, yeah, definitely will. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, I, I, I would have to say uh, as far as inspirations, um, I have I have a lot of them. Um, uh, a a couple a couple of them uh, do include um, Bill Watterson and um, Hiro Oda as well. Um, but I I also do agree with uh, what Steens was mentioning earlier too because um, I'm. I'm really grateful uh, to get to do panels like this as well and uh, learn from both Steens and D because um, again, like I, I understand that there's an added layer of work and an added layer of just a lot of different things that you have to, uh, figure out and, and go through as far as the process of doing comic strips when you're working with uh, these syndicates. So yeah, I really appreciate getting to learn from the different uh, comic artists that are around me and the ones that are out there putting their work out. So yeah, um, I'd, I'd say that's a, a huge thing for me too. Um, but yeah, so I'll had my stuff to the chat. Great, thanks LJ. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Super D? And I, you don't have to say Jim Davis, we know Jim Davis. <laughs> <laughs> this is so obvious. <laughs> well, um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Super D2, uh, S-U-P-R-D-E-E-2. Uh, you can find most of my comics on superd2.com. Uh, Rosebuds in particular, you can find on Go Comics, uh, gocomics.com slash rosebuds. Um, and as for my inspirations, uh, two in particular, one is uh, Dave Pilkey, uh, Captain Underpants fame. I like between that and Garfield, they have really have shaped who I am today. Uh, Don Wimmer and Pat Brady of Roses Rose. Uh, they have really cemented what my humor is, all that, you know, enjoying the little things in life and, you know, loving those around you and things like that. I, I just get butterflies in my stomach whenever I read the comic. I, I love it to death. Um, and as Stins and LJ said, like, I also get it from my peers because, you know, where I live, there's almost a non-existent community of cartoonists. So the people I know tend to be everywhere, not in Indiana. So getting to be able to learn and talk with other like-minded individuals who, who, do the, who, who do this sort of thing is incredible. And it's super fun to see all the different perspectives and life journeys and all of us building each other up and supporting what we do. Like this, like this is my first, you know, panel at a con. And the fact that you guys, you know, thought of me enough to, you know, want to be here with you guys, it, it, it's an honor. And, you know, this is something that I, I, I want to help, you know, build up and create that we can get more cartoonists together and more people, you know, bringing themselves together through just creating something that they love to make, you know? And so, yeah. Words to live by, my brother. I am on that way with you. And I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to join us tonight. I'm so glad that all of our panelists were here to join us with this amazing conversation. I mean, we could talk for another three hours. Mm -hmm. I've got so many more questions and I wanna hear so much more about you guys. So we're gonna have to do this panel again sometime soon so we can continue it. But thank you all so much for being here. Thanks for having this great conversation. Thank you, Ladies Con, for having us. Um, and uh, definitely go out and check out the rest of the Ladies Con's panel and the, um, the live event on Saturday. And uh, thank you all very much for joining us.
Uh, just want to echo all of that. Thanks. This was an amazing panel. I learned a lot and um, I was really touched at that conversation at the end. So thank you so much for being part of this. Um, for those who were here, we will be uh, reposting this on YouTube, as I said earlier, um, after the event. And you can go to ladiescon.com to check out our other vendors, panels, and programming. Thank you so much and have a wonderful night.